We departed camp on the evening of September the 14th, with Killer Mouse, Frank Buck II, and Major Bay accompanying me in the boat. I was placed under my sleeping mat and the guard's equipment and was ordered to remain still. After several hours of traveling, I was told to sit up as we came to a hut at the edge of a hamlet. Mom M stood on the bank above the canal and gave directions to Major Bay. I was taken into the hut and immediately placed inside my mosquito net, which had been hastily strung up before I entered. I was apparently not to be seen. The old man and woman who lived in the hut greeted Major Bay warmly, and the men began talking softly about mutual friends and party functions they'd attended. I gathered that the owner of this hut was the Hamlet political cadre for the front. Shortly after the conversation ended, all of them went to bed. The next morning I was awake before the cadre, but not before the young daughter of the house. She was up and cooking before the others had stirred. Her mother arose grumbling minutes after the daughter and squatted in the kitchen, supervising the preparation of breakfast. The guards provided fish for our meal, which the young girl cleaned and cooked. I had heard the cadre say so often that all they had to do was travel in the countryside and the people provided food for them. Yet for this trip, I had been forced to contribute six Ikea lock for rations. We were not getting anything from the people in this particular hut. Major Bay told me to take down my net and go into the small partitioned section of the hut where the mother and father slept. Inside the sleeping section I sat on the edge of the wooden rack, looking at the sparsely furnished room. In addition to the sleeping rack, there was one straight chair, a small rectangular mirror, and a makeshift clothing rack made from old wooden ammunition boxes. The cadre and guards squatted just outside the door, waiting until the young girl served them rice and fish on a large round aluminum platter. The mother and daughter stayed in the kitchen, watching while the men ate. According to the cadre, men and women in the revolution were equal, but it didn't seem to apply at mealtime. Major Bay had F.B. II take my plate and give me a serving of rice and a chunk of fish. I sat back on the sleeping rack and scooped the rice down with my chopsticks, oblivious to everything around me until I sensed someone staring at me. I looked up into the perplexed eyes of the young girl and smiled at her. She disappeared from sight behind the partition and I went back to eating. I felt her scrutiny again and looked up to see two almond eyes peering at me from the edge of the thatch partition. This time she didn't hide when I smiled. Instead, she slipped quickly to the edge of the entrance of the room and squatted down, studying me intently as I continued to eat. Major Bay asked what she was doing. I've never seen an American before, and now I'm looking at one very closely, she answered. She seemed fascinated by my ability to use the chopsticks with the ease of a Vietnamese, hardly the picture of the American aggressor she had expected. I continued to shovel rice into my mouth, pausing to smile at her when her examination became so intense I thought her eyes would pop. The old lady squatted beside her and they exchanged rapid comments, obviously about me with the gray-headed mother turning to Major Bay and chuckling as she told him I was more Vietnamese than American. Major Bay choked on his mouthful of rice and cautioned them that I was to be considered dangerous, even though a captive. My sun-darkened skin, hardly the de Trang or white skin they had expected, coupled with my ability to eat as they did, were distinct surprises to the family. I added to their series of discoveries by telling the young girl in Vietnamese that the rice and fish she had prepared were delicious. There was open-mouthed silence when the two females realized I had spoken in their language. When they did speak, it was both of them at once, firing questions at me in unintelligible confusion. Finally, the old lady tapped the young girl on the back of the head as a sign to be quiet, and then asked me if I liked rice and Nuuk Mom. I lied, and told her I enjoyed it very much when I was able to get good Nuuk Mom like she served. She stood up smiling and walked back into the kitchen, clucking to herself. The young girl scooted closer to me and timidly asked if I thought their hut was pretty. I assured her it was the most beautiful hut I had seen in almost five years, which was apparently the right thing to have said as she grinned behind the palm placed in front of her lips, her eyes reflecting sparkling glints of light. The old lady returned with a brimming bowl of fresh new akmam and offered it to me for my rice. They both squatted and watched with total absorption as I managed to force the watery rice and new akmam soup down my protesting throat, slurping with feigned pleasure and appreciation. Major Bay was glaring at me through the open partition, and I could imagine his displeasure at this counter-propaganda effort of mine. Just before noon, there was a good deal of activity outside the hut, 
and shortly thereafter, Mafia entered the hut and told me to prepare for a trip to visit my old post. They had obtained, with great difficulty, a larger boat with a two-horsepower motor and enough gasoline to take us on the day's journey. Mafia explained the ground rules to me. No talking with the civilians, keep my head lowered and look repentant in the presence of civilians, pay strict attention to the lessons that would be taught me during the trip, and rely on the cadre of the front to protect me from the wrath of the people who hated Americans. Outside were a scrubbed-faced 16-year-old girl who was the official photographer, a wizened old gentleman with snowy hair who was the district representative of the Central Committee, a middle-aged, sharp-faced individual who was a journalist for the Western news agencies, a teenaged boy acting as boatman, and the ever-present Killer Mouse and Frank Buck II. Mafia was quite obviously the honcho on this operation with Major Bay as second in command. We all loaded in the boat, and I found myself sandwiched between Mafia and the journalist in the rear of the boat. I didn't recognize any of the terrain as we put it along the narrow canal, although Mafia assured me we were nearing Tanfu. As we came to a broad intersection of our canal and a much wider one, Mafia pointed to a reed-covered bank diagonally across the intersection. There is Tanfu Post, he declared. I stared in disbelief. There wasn't anything there. In my mind, I reconstructed the picture of Tan Fu with its concrete ammunition bunker, walls, and tall watchtower, structures which might have remained even though the post had been overrun, but there was no sign that anything had ever existed above ground level. There were only the reeds swaying gently in the hot breeze. I tried to orient myself, wondering what direction we had approached from. Then I saw the skeletal concrete piers of the bridge which had crossed the Chohoi Canal, rising out of the canal to my front. The bridge had been totally destroyed. The canal we were traveling on was what had been Canal Number 1, and where the village had once stood on the banks to my right and left, there was now only a wide place in the canal. Not even the banks remained. The wider canal in front of us, running perpendicular to our path, was the canal Song Trem, running to Thoi Bin, my old district capital. There were the partially shattered piers for the bridge that used to link the camp with the village. I couldn't fit this picture of utter desolation into my memory of the camp we had helped build and defend. The faces of the villagers I'd known. The busy marketplace, the village children standing on the arched bridge catching small fish in the evenings. I had prepared myself for seeing the post destroyed, but not the entire area leveled. I was barely conscious of Mafia as he described the battles which had been fought over this ground pointing out a large painted tin sign on the bank with a picture of a Viet Cong leaping into battle, and the words describing the great victory. The young camera girl was snapping pictures as Mafia gestured more for her benefit than mine. We moved slowly down the Chohoi Canal, between the slender concrete pillars that had supported the steel bridge we used to dive off of when we swam in the canal. I glanced to the opposite bank, away from camp, searching for the Catholic church that had stood just beyond the bridge. Only a few scarred trees and more waving reeds remained. This was the meaning of their total destruction. No buildings, no animals, no people. Tan Fu had ceased to exist, except as a memory. Cho Hoi was another shock. This village, just like Tan Fu, had ceased to exist. Where the houses had been was bare packed earth, still scorched from the fires. Across the canal, where the post had been, there now stood a Viet Cong cemetery with its rows of markers and the brilliantly painted wooden arch declaring this was a hero's cemetery. I wondered if all the markers were for men killed in the battles for Tan Fu and Cho Hoi. If so, they paid quite a price for the two posts. They'd have to expand if there were any more heroes to go in here. Mafia took advantage of my barely concealed uneasiness to emphasize the lesson of strength of the NLF as proven by their ability to wipe out the series of posts in the area. I had no reply, since it was obvious that nothing had been spared and the confidence they had shown traveling through this zone seemed justified. I was wondering what had happened to all the people in the villages, but realized I could get no answer from the cadre. No doubt the enemies of the people were punished. We were traveling southwest toward the hamlet of Dao Nai when Mafia told me I would now view the crimes of the U.S. imperialists. We stopped against a high bank and got out of the boat. The guards and boatmen left with Major Bay and the district representative to find a representative of the Catholic congregation in this hamlet, designated Hotan Lock by a large sign on the front of a partially destroyed Catholic church to our front. 
While we waited for the others to return, Mafia reviewed the lesson I had learned by viewing the destroyed posts and villages. He avoided answering questions about the immediate area, as if unwilling to launch into the new script until the entire cast was on stage. Almost thirty minutes passed before the others returned and notified Mafia that the local churchman would appear presently. Apparently the word had gotten around that an American was in the hamlet, because the youngsters began to appear from all sides. We were followed by a chattering throng as we walked to the church, and my two guards were unable to disperse the youngsters. Mafia warned me that the young people in this hamlet had a fierce hatred before the aggressor, and told me to assume the repentant posture. Aside from the occasional touching of my arm and unmistakable request for gum, I found the children satisfied to watch me through wide, wondering eyes. Major Bay assumed the role of teacher for this part of my instruction, and explained that this church had been built by the people of the hamlet, so they might enjoy the practice of their religious belief. But the structure had been destroyed by U.S. aircraft, and I was taken on an inside and outside tour of the building in order to see the wreckage. The corrugated iron church was ornately decorated inside through the efforts of local artisans and carpenters with tin cut, shaped, and painted to form the basic accoutrements of a Catholic chapel. The pews, made from locally obtained wood, had survived the airstrike. The statuary near the altar had been shattered by the rocket fragments and machine gun fire that had torn gaping holes in the roof and walls. The floor was littered with debris, and no apparent effort had been made to clean up the wreckage, even though a rapid estimate showed that several hours of concentrated effort could have greatly reduced, if not completely eliminated, the minor rubble lying around. The roofing stringers had been shattered, but could have been replaced. The major damage was to the corrugated iron, which was thoroughly perforated. The camera girl was at work taking pictures of me as I was led from point to point by the cadre, ensuring that three ingredients were present in each photo, NLF cadre pointing and explaining, USPOW looking and listening in wreckage. Major Bay informed me that 37 rockets had hit the church and thousands of bullets. Mafia took me around the church to show the lack of fortifications in the immediate area and the absence of any troops. Not that any of us expected to see any large number of uniformed soldiers standing around. The major lesson to be gained, according to the cadre, was that the United States, a Christian nation, had destroyed a church, thus depriving another Christian group of their ability to worship. Several incidents caused me to think seriously about the concept these cadre were attempting to impress on me. Major Bay and the chapel had stopped by the altar and, in exhibiting the broken statuary, had picked up the severed head of the Christ child and called the camera girl to take a picture of me standing in front of the altar holding the head. I was immediately repulsed by the crude effort for propaganda, not only because of the sacrilege in exploiting an already desecrated figure, but because of the use of a religious symbol by an atheist who had no more understanding or feeling for the faith represented by the church in any form than he had for what he considered a painted plaster head. I refused to comply and took Mafia by surprise when I commented on Major Bay's obvious lack of understanding of my religious beliefs and disregard for the policy of the Front, which respected my beliefs, as he attempted to force me to be a part of a propaganda ploy using the Christ Child. The second thought-provoking discovery was provided by one of the villagers, an older woman who commented quietly that over 100 rockets had been fired into the large rice paddy behind the church without touching the structure. I knew our aircraft wouldn't attack a church without reason, and we never fired a load of rockets like that into an empty field. Granted, there were no VC troops in the area now, but how long ago did the incident occur and what were the circumstances then? As usual, the cadre told a person only what they wanted him to know in order for him to draw the required conclusions. Fortunately, I was still able to think for myself. As a final part of the tour, I was given a lecture by the representative of the Catholic worshippers in the village. He was a tightly drawn, intense younger man who stood on the front portico of the church and delivered an oration on the crimes of the U.S. imperialists and their lackeys in Saigon. The familiar rhetoric sounded like a replay from Radio Hanoi or Radio Liberation and more like a political cadre than a church leader. I asked if he was a priest and learned that he was the local NLF cadre who doubled as both political and religious representative, an unlikely combination but efficient in controlling the people. 
His congregation stood silently in the presence of the higher-ranking cadre with me and seemed preoccupied during his speech. Only Mafia, Major Bay, and I were involved in the discourse. When he finished, I was led back to the boat and the older people in the crowd began to disperse silently. The younger children were making a game of swinging on the bell rope, sending hollow clangings from the single church bell echoing across the vast paddy land. A visit to a Khmer temple near the Catholic Church ended this portion of the trip. The temple had been severely damaged by fragmentation bombs and I was once again given a tour of the wreckage, after which the villagers in the area were gathered together while Major Bay lectured them on the purpose of my visit, to see the proof of U.S. crimes and for the people to see an American POW. He became involved in his own rhetoric and went on for about 15 or 20 minutes until Mafia finally caught his eye and got him to stop. A Khmer monk, who lived nearby and was responsible for the temple, was called upon to condemn the crimes before the assembled people. The quiet, dignified man in his flowing yellow robe stood in the midst of the seated and squatting circle of people for a moment, his eyes on the ground. Then he looked up at me as I stood, flanked by the two guards and cadre. He spoke slowly, softly in Cambodian while one of the men in the crowd translated from Cambodian into Vietnamese. Mafia translated from Vietnamese into English for me, but it was unnecessary since the speech was brief and clear in the Vietnamese language. Mafia's translation began accurately, but after the first few sentences he began to insert his own words. The speech was not what he intended for me to hear. After the twenty-minute hate-filled tirade by Major Bay, the monk spoke for perhaps two minutes and his message was of love and hope. Death is our brother, and suffering, our sister. These are the relationships forced upon us not by our choosing, but as our part in life. These we bear, but our teachings are of the greater blessings which await us at the termination of this period. Hatred is of this world, and will serve no purpose in the next. To pursue the evils of this world it binds us forever to them. What we must bear is difficult, but let us not contribute to the fires which consume us and thus perpetuate them so they also consume our children. He looked levelly at Mafia, turned and walked slowly away. I was hustled quickly away from the still-seated people and put back in the boat. Mafia was speaking rapidly as the boat putted noisily down the canal in the late afternoon sun. He reviewed the lessons I should have learned in seeing the hypocrisy of the Christian U.S. nation destroying the people's ability to worship and denying them their beliefs. I listened, but was beginning to feel a warm sort of glow inside, as I heard only the voice of the monk and remembered the actions of the people who were supposed to hate me. It was dark as we returned along the Cho Hoi Canal, traveling back toward Tan Fu. Mafia said there would be one final stop at a village where the people were holding a meeting to discuss the revolution and their contributions in the coming week to ensure attainment of final victory. He cautioned me that this would be very dangerous for me, since the people in this area had a burning hatred of the Americans and only the presence of the cadre would prevent the people from beating me to death. I was to be exhibited at the meeting and would have to be tied. I would have to maintain the head-down repentant attitude in the presence of the people in order to ensure my safety. When he mentioned the name of the village, I was startled. It was near Tan Fu Post, and in 1963 we had run medical patrols into the village, bringing in food and clothing, and had developed a reasonably strong rapport with the people. I realized that this was the reason Mafia had questioned me about the intelligence net that had existed in this area. It would have been extremely inopportune if some of the people who had worked with the government back in 1963 were still present and I could get in the briefest contact with them. I was thankful I had played dumb during the questioning and given him no answer. As the boat pulled up to the palm-lined bank, I saw and heard a throng of young people from children through teenagers lining the bank and talking among themselves. The word that was repeated over and over was, My, my, American, American. The news was out that an American would be present. It was not an angry shout, but almost a festive air prevailed. I was dragged from the boat in a display of authority by my two guards and led through a jostling crowd of curious youths. Mafia tried to get them to clear a path without success, and I began to wonder about my safety in case the crowd was hostile. In the crush of bodies, there would be no way for the guards or cadre to protect me should someone decide to take out his anger on me. I was surprised when only the guards and Mafia were crowded. 
I was given a small space in which to proceed, always surrounded but not pushed. Hands reached out and touched my arms, stroking the arm hair. In the half-light of a single carbide lamp, faces appeared around me, some openly curious, some smiling. On the far side of a partially destroyed shed was a cleared, packed earth circle, crowded with people. The carbide lamp hung from a tree branch cast dancing shadows across the faces of elders, middle-aged people, male and female, teenagers, children and babes in arms. The cadre must have turned out every available warm body in the whole area. As we approached, a cadre was lecturing the crowd on the glorious victories of the Liberation Armed Forces in their march toward final victory. His high-pitched harangue and violent gesturing weren't drawing too much attention, and he had to pause several times to call to the chattering group to be quiet in order that he might be heard. I began to wonder about the people's enthusiasm for contributing to the revolution. My appearance was the signal for total silence as all faces turned toward me. Mafia leaned toward me, pushing down on the back of my head with his hand. Look repentant. I stood between Mafia and Major Bay as the cadre completed his spiel and introduced the white-haired district representative who had been traveling with us. He commanded more respect than the cadre and spoke for several minutes to the now quiet crowd, explaining the importance of unified effort of all the people to accomplish the goals of the revolution and once again bring peace and prosperity to the reunited fatherland. I was glancing around the rows of faces, searching for anyone who might have been familiar. Mafia once again pushed my head down, cautioning me. Look repentant and don't anger the people. I could feel the eyes of the crowd focusing on me, and there was a curious absence of apprehension on my part. I felt no atmosphere of antagonism or hatred. To my left rear, at the back of the crowd, I heard several voices talking audible in the silence of the rest of the crowd. The word Trungui's lieutenant caught my attention and listening more closely I heard, Dola Trungui. That's the lieutenant. Another voice replied, Da Tengika. Yes, what's his name? Yet another voice cut in, Quen Roa, Fai La Trungui. I've forgotten. But it must be the lieutenant. There was a surge of elation. I had been recognized. Mafia was introduced by the district representative and stepped forward into the circle of light to deliver a short speech. As he was explaining the trip I had been taken on and the lessons I had learned, he mentioned that I was the American lieutenant, captured at the Battle of Tan Fu in October 1963. There was a murmur in the crowd and the voices to my left rear broke out softly, excitedly, verifying their identification. Mafia continued explaining the crimes of the U.S. imperialists against the people in this area and saying that the cadre had explained and taught me that the respect the people had for the NLF prevented them from killing me immediately in retaliation for the sufferings my people had brought to the countryside. He pleaded with them to realize that I was a prisoner and was learning of the crimes I had committed in order to repent of them and join in helping the Vietnamese people struggle for their freedom. There was silence from the crowd, only the curious eyes fastened on me. Suddenly I felt a hand on my shoulder and flinched. The hand remained gently touching, and a voice behind my ear asked, Mon Kong Trung Ui? Are you all right, Lieutenant? The flooding of relief and release of tension was enough to make my knees go weak. I managed to nod, yes. The hand patted me, and there was one word, Tot. Good. The hand was gone, but I had gotten my answer about the people. Mafia could say anything he wanted now. Someone had taken the risk of slipping up behind me among the group of young people and checking to see if I was okay. That gesture in itself was enough to shoot the whole staged production Mafia was carrying out. I was pushed roughly out beside Mafia by one of the guards and exhibited as a prize of war. Mafia encouraged the people saying that Americans were not so awesome as the propaganda led some to believe. In my weakened condition, I was the example of the American soldier who would certainly be defeated on all battlefields in Vietnam. He assured the people that he had many more American prisoners he could have brought, but one was enough to convey his idea. I was studying a beetle crawling laboriously across the packed earth toward the center of light when there was a commotion to my right front and a scrawny, bushy-haired man sprang out of the crowd with his fist upraised, screaming, Da Dao de Quoc Mai! Down with the American imperialists! I tensed, waiting for the blow to land. Then nothing happened. I glanced up and the man was standing in front of me, quivering, with his face contorted and his fist still clenched. 
Mafia interjected quickly. He is crippled by U.S. helicopters. My first thought was that he was quite agile for a cripple. Mafia made no move, and the man continued to stand in front of me. All at once, a cadre stepped out of the group of leaders to my left with his arms outspread and blurted in an imploring voice. My compatriots, my compatriots, restrain your anger. Do not strike the prisoner. Show compassion. Dan's story of the staged hate session he and John had been subjected to on their trip in 1967 flashed into my mind and I began to smile to myself. It was like a grade school play and someone had missed his cue. I looked into the face of the man in front of me. His eyes were on the speaking cadre, his fist still raised to strike, but his next action obviously forgotten. When the cadre finished the short speech on the people's loyalty to the front, the man was even more uncertain what to do. I was watching him with open curiosity. Finally, he looked around, managed a sheepish gold-capped grin, and shuffled back into the crowd. Someone cackled a crone's laugh back in the midst of the people. Major Bay stepped into the center of the meeting to give a closing speech after the cadre restored order. He had just begun to speak when an old grandmother, chewing her betel nut, walked up beside me and stood looking at me through half-closed eyes. She reached out and jabbed a bony finger into my ribs. I wondered what was going to happen. Next, she felt my forearm and biceps, squeezing what there was left of muscle, until she touched bone. I began to feel like a side of beef being inspected at market. Major Bay was in the midst of his talk, but the crowd was watching the drama involving the old lady, the POW and Mafia. Ignoring Major's Bay voice, she asked Mafia in a sharp voice, Do you mistreat him? Mafia was caught off balance and failed to reply. Do you give him enough to eat? she demanded. Mafia assured her I was well-fed and not mistreated. The grandmother wasn't satisfied. I remember this boy when he came to our hamlet in 1963. He was a strong boy, very husky, and now he looks weak and sick. You must not be taking care of him. Mafia was on a spot as the attention of the crowd focused on his answers. There was good-humored chuckling running through the crowd at this little old lady putting a powerful cadre in a tight situation. The front provides for the well-being of the POWs, Mafia reiterated. You must remember the Americans are criminals and deserve only death. He began to slip into the standard line. But the front is lenient and spares their lives so they can realize their mistakes. The old lady wouldn't accept the reasoning. I know what it is like to be hungry and sick and there is no leniency in inflicting that on another. Mafia was looking anxiously at Major Bay, whose speech had trailed off to silence. There was no help from the tall cadre. Finally, Mafia turned to me in apparent desperation. Tell her you are well treated, he ordered sharply. I put my head lower and looked repentant. The next thing I realized, Frank Buck II and Killer Mouse had my arms and were dragging me into the darkness toward the canal and the boat. Minutes later, we were on our way back to the hut we had stopped in the night before, moving rapidly away from the meeting place. All the way to the hut, Mafia and Major Bay bombarded me with how fortunate I was to have gotten away from the crowd before they had beaten me. The cadre were careful to outline completely the lessons I had learned during the day, ensuring that I had each major point clearly in my mind. No mention was made of what I had seen, only of what they had wanted me to see. We stopped only briefly at the hut before setting out on an all-night trip, traveling across narrow out-of-the-way canals until we reached another hamlet, many kilometers north of the first hut. Several hours before daylight, we approached a cluster of small huts along both sides of the canal. This, Major Bay told me sleepily, was deep in a liberated zone where the front was strongly supported. I glanced around at the shabbily constructed huts and squalor that was worse than any I'd seen in either government-protected or even contested zones. This was the new life the people were making for themselves under the freedoms imposed in a liberated zone, and what I was seeing hardly matched the glowing descriptions I had received in indoctrinations. We proceeded down the canal to a pre-selected hut where Major Bay, the two guards and I, would stay. Its owner was the village political cadre and had volunteered his hut for our use. Mafia and Mom M left us there while they went in search of quarters for themselves. As we walked up to the small, one-room thatched hut, the old man and his wife stood in the doorway silhouetted by a flickering kerosene lamp in the hut. Major Bay greeted the older man, probably in his sixties, 
and accepted the bowing gesture the old man made to him. The political rank took precedence over respect for elders, I noted, as Major Bay chatted with the couple, asking about the crops and work of the village committee. The old man answered, smiling, but the old lady remained silent. I was watching her as I had watched and listened to the older women the day before. They seemed to be unintimidated by the cadre, as if they had lived their lives and had nothing to fear. It developed that this old couple was being forced to move out of their hut in order for the four of us to move in. The village cadre had the responsibility for housing us, and had to give up his own hut to fulfill the requirement. The man was indebted to the revolution for the lands he now farmed, and they could be taken from him as easily as they had been confiscated from one of his unfortunate neighbors, who was condemned as an enemy of the people. The two men finished sipping the tea provided by the village cadre, and the couple departed, leaving us to prepare for sleep. Killer Mouse and Frank Buck II immediately strung a single mosquito net for both of them, and curled up together. Major Bay indicated a cleared space on the mud floor where I was to sleep, and I was soon in a dreamless, exhausted slumber. The next day was a day of rest while the cadre prepared for some type of function to be held in the village. The guards prepared a few of our remaining fish for a midday meal and spent the rest of the day eating fruit picked from a large tri oi tree outside the hut. I was given several at Major Bay's suggestion when he checked on me and found me sitting on the floor feeding grains of rice to the family rooster, while the guards sat on the bed rack stuffing down the fruit. The old lady appeared shortly thereafter and immediately began checking out her hut. The guards had used her rainwater to cook the rice, had burned her firewood, and were throwing the fruit stems on the floor. None of these actions went unnoticed, and she collared Major Bay, much to his embarrassment, and set him straight on the correct behavior for guests in her house. There was no doubt from her tone of voice and orders, that she expected to be obeyed. After all, she was the grandmother, and these were children to her. Major Bay made amends as best possible, assuring her the guards would cut their own firewood and leave her with more than she had before they came, canal water would be used for the rice instead of the precious rainwater, and her hut would be swept out every morning. I was ordered to stay inside the hut to avoid being seen, but went out on several occasions to make a crap run and got a chance to look around. The old man had a large plot of land with papayas, pineapples, coconuts, and manioc, in addition to his rice paddy. With all of this, I noticed the old woman catching small fish from the canal for a meager meal of rice and the tiny fish. Cooked in Nuak Mom, my guards offered her none of our fish. I wondered why they didn't eat some of their produce, and asked the old man later that afternoon when he came in to drink some of his tea, depleted by my two guards' constant sipping during the day. I learned that he was required to contribute from two-thirds to three-quarters of what he produced to the revolution, to feed the soldiers, and had little for himself and his wife. That was another point in my diary, given more land than before but required to contribute most of what he produced to the revolution. Some total is that he works harder and has less to show for it. The next morning Mafia came by and told me I was to attend a press conference, comprising the journalists from the Liberation News Agency progressive journalists of Vietnam, and a representative from the Western press. I was suddenly aware of the purpose behind the long hours of indoctrination, the repetition of questions and the front's answers, the probing of my thoughts and corrections to my thoughts, his urgent need to control my thoughts. Mafia stated the reason for me. You are a prisoner for a long time and you are still alive. You are the living truth of the policy of the front and must represent to these men what you have learned and what you can know about the unjust war of the U.S. imperialists. I had survived, little thanks to the front, other than the fact that they hadn't killed me outright, and now I was the living truth of their policy. Bullshit, I thought. I'm living proof that an American can be a little tougher and a little more determined than you ever counted on. Major Bay and several other cadre appeared in the doorway entering when Mafia motioned to me. All were smiling and quite friendly shaking my hand and inquiring about my health and my family and asking if I was ready to return home. We chatted for 15 or 20 minutes, with Mafia interpreting, until my answers began to come before he finished translating the questions, and the conversation was conducted strictly in Vietnamese. I found my initial apprehension decreasing as the men joked and made me feel quite at ease. 
They seemed assured that I was going home soon, and this was a last essential part of my preparation, like a final exam. I hated the surge of elation that the talk of release brought. I wasn't going to surrender now, I thought. Mafia waited until the others left and spoke with me alone. You must be careful in your answers today. A representative of the Central Committee is here to judge your case and consider your release. You can speak the truth, act according to your conscience, but do not criticize the Liberation Front. Those were the ground rules as I was taken to a dilapidated shed that had been decorated with worn bedspreads covering the open walls and had various slogans painted on signs around the small room. The NLF flag was fastened on the wall behind a raised table at the end of the room. Long, poncho-covered tables ran the length of the walls on both sides of the front table, forming a U-shaped seating arrangement. I was taken into a back room where the displaced poultry was tied by strings around their legs and stood waiting among the ducks and chickens until Killer Mouse came in to get me. As I entered the conference room again, there were ten other men besides myself, the two guards and Mafia. The three cadre who had visited with me prior to this were all seated to my left, and Mafia sat at my right elbow. Across from me were the press representatives with their pads of paper and tape recorders. Four separate microphones were placed in front of me. Mom M was seated at the end of the press table, and Major Bay sat in a lone chair at the far side of the room. With all the cadre I could identify and the representative of the Central Committee sitting behind the front table, I counted only four possible journalists. Not much of a turnout, but par for the course. The opening statement from the Central Committee representative welcomed the members of the journalistic community to the grand press conference held by the National Liberation Front to enable them to discuss the conditions of the war firsthand with an American prisoner of war who had been a captive for an extended period of time. It was, he said, a unique opportunity for them to have at their disposal such a prisoner who had lived under the lenient policy of the Front and was physical proof of the treatment given by the Front. After that, he opened the floor to questions with Mafia translating for me from Vietnamese into English so I would understand the questions completely. There was no hesitation from the journalists as they plunged into a line of questioning that could have come straight from Mafia's lessons. What is the course of the war? and on what side is the just cause? What are the crimes of the U.S. imperialists in SVN? What is your participation in the U.S. effort, and can you realize your misdeeds? Mafia gave me a sheet of paper and a pen, telling me to arrange my thoughts before answering and to remember that the front would judge my case by what I said. It was a very neat cul-de-sac in which I had the answers for every question they asked, the exact answers they wanted, and if I gave them those answers, I might be released. If not, I could go back and probably rot before any other chance came up. Some of the questions demanded an outright condemnation of my government and our army, something I would not do, and I found myself straining for ambiguity, pushing to take up time and space without saying anything. Mafia let it go on the first few questions and then stopped me to reiterate my duty to report the facts accurately as I had learned them. In other words, quit lying and tell the men what he'd pounded into me. I found that as the familiar questions were asked, Mafia's answers that had been repeated so many times, driving them into my mind, came to my lips immediately without my thinking and I had to bite them back lest they slip out. The questioning turned to the trip I had been taken on, to Tanfu and the church. I was able to comment factually that I had never expected to see the total destruction of not only the post, but the entire village and to view the apparent physical control exerted by the front in that area. I commented that the destruction of the church was distressing to me, and I hoped that the people would soon be able to rebuild their place of worship. I noticed a few sour faces and downcast eyes when I commented that it takes more than the destruction of a church to destroy faith in God if the believers have a true faith. Mafia again warned me to stick to what I had learned, referring to the lessons I should have learned and not my own philosophy. There was a break after about two hours and a teenage girl brought several plates of cookies and some pieces of candy in for refreshments. The cadre and journalists stood around chatting while Mafia gave me a serious talk about responding correctly to the questioning. I realized he was quite angry but was containing himself. Up to this point his pupil hadn't shown the proper attitude and Mafia was going to answer to his superiors for it. 
I would have to answer to Mafia, who could be a son of a bitch if he was pissed off. I decided to play it a little looser during the next portion and pull some of the pressure off. When we began again I was asked about the policy of the front and my treatment as a POW. I gave the standard I have not been beaten or physically tortured. I have received sufficient rice for my meals. I wouldn't mention food. I have been given items necessary for survival. Mosquito net, sleeping mat, clothing. In times of serious illness I have been given medication. No mention of what kind or how much. No mention of how sick before anything was given at all. Mafia was pleased with that answer. I mentioned that the cadre of the front had the mission to instruct and correct the attitude of American POWs, and in my case they had been very patient over a long period of time, dealing with my incorrect attitude. Mafia interpreted it as a reference to benevolence on the part of the cadre, and everyone beamed at me for my understanding. The session went on with me trading bits of Mafia's lessons for time, wishing the tape would run out. At about four in the afternoon, the Central Committee representative declared the conference at an end and I was taken back to the hut. I felt drained and hoped I hadn't compromised my precarious position. Back at the hut, I sat waiting for the next move. The guards had made no effort to repair the old lady's kitchen floor, nor had they replaced her firewood. Instead, they had eaten most of the fruit from her tree and picked her pepper bush clean, taking the red peppers for their meals later when we were back in the forest. Major Bay had made a minimum effort to sweep the floor, succeeding only in pushing the trash under the sleeping rack. I took mental note of these actions, contrasting them with the glowing accounts the cadre had given me of the love and mutual support shared by the soldiers and people. I wondered why there had been no sharing of our fish with the people and nothing given by the people to us. Where was the open, warm support? 